so good evening everybody uh, respected dr anita a professor and head department of economics professor lekha chakraborty from national institute of public finance and uh, policy and research at public finance and policy my colleagues professor ak prasad professor shija uh, dr christabel mr siddiq other respected teachers and uh, senior professors family members of uh, ramachandran sir friends and students so welcome to the ninth annual lecture commemorating the late professor k ramachandran nayar and uh, all the eight lectures that we have conducted they were in an offline mode and uh, we had it in our seminar hall here and this year we had waited for the covid problem to subside so that we could organize the program here but since the issue persists we had decided to conduct this lecture online and uh, as you are aware uh, professor ramachandran uh, nayar was a very influential teacher of economics a thinker and a policy maker who had made very commendable contributions uh, towards the academic and the policy arena in the state of kerala and his teaching career in the department of economics uh, university of kerala spans across 20 years from 1978 to 1998 where he served as professor and head from during the period 1991 to 1998 and he was a teacher par excellence he molded the career of his students uh, the coveted Uh, positions held by them at the national and the international levels are a testimony to this and as a researcher he had made a very important contributions in the areas of uh, labor economics uh, macro economics international economics and planning and the similar work on uh, history of trade unions in kerala demonstrates his analytical research skills and as a policy maker or as a, as a contributor to policy making he was engaged with many committees of the government and contributed immensely towards the innovative and practical solutions for many social issues of sanaya was member state pay commission government of kerala director of the study on cost of cultivation of principal crops governing body member of center for development studies chairman minimum wages advisory board and member kerala state planning board the economic fraternity adores professor ramachandran nayar for his imprints that he had made as a teacher as a researcher and policy maker above all he was a philanthropist whose empathy always went with the hapless and the marginalized sections of the society and uh, our dear sir remains as a guiding spirit and leading light for all his students and friends and upon his demise uh, his colleagues students friends and family members under the leadership of professor m k sarlama and professor prasad ak decided to form an endowment and organize a lecture annually to commemorate his contributions and this is the ninth memorial lecture and the earlier lectures were delivered by professor prabhat patnaik devi ghosh cp chandrashekar ma uman vk ramachandran patmini swaminathan surajit masundar and deepa shankar and this year for the memorial lecture we have a renowned development economist professor lekha chakraborty from national institute of uh, Uh, public uh, finance and policy and who is also the research affiliate of levy economics institute new york she is an elected member of the governing board of management international institute of uh, public finance and uh, that's a world association for public finance economists she is pioneer economist in institutionalizing gender budgeting in india with the uh, chief economic advisor ministry of finance government of india in 2004 and her areas of interest are macroeconomics of public finance fiscal federalism financing human development and gender budgeting and she is a regular columnist in the indian express the hindu the financial express and the business line and she has worked for the imf the world bank the undp the un women women and the commonwealth secretariat and her work experience on macro fiscal policy and human development spans across several countries and these are her academic credentials but more than that professor lekha is a student of this department very favorite student of professor k ramachandran nayar and lekha did her post graduation here during 1993 95 when uh, professor nayar was the head of the department personally for me uh, she is my classmate and a great friend i remember her doing her pg dissertation under professor ramachandran sir on industrial disputes and it's a very valuable occasion for the department of economics when an alumnus is delivering the lecture commemorating the contributions of a great professor and she will speak on the topic covid 19 and macroeconomic policy responses on which she has published a lot with much love and respect we welcome you 
Professor Lekha Chakrabarti for the lecture. And Professor Anida, head of the department, has helped and guided in organizing the program and she will deliver the presidential address. Welcome, Dr. Anida, to the program. And I extend our welcome to all my colleagues, senior professors, uh, alumni of the department, friends, and uh, all to the program. And we are happy that Ramachandra Nisar's family, his daughter Sindhu and son-in-law, Professor Narayanan, has joined. We welcome you with love to the program. And with these words, once again, I welcome all of you to the program and invite Professor Anita for the presidential address. Thank you so much. Good evening to all and all. At the outset, I, uh, I be a warm welcome to Professor Ramendra uh, Nair Memorial Lecture on COVID-19 and Macroeconomic Policy Responses uh, by Professor Lekha Chakravarti. As you all know that Professor Ramachandran Nair was a great visionary, has a number of publications to his credit, including Industry Relations in Kerala, published by Sterling in 1974. But the book inspired me is the History of Trade Union Movements in Kerala, in which he applied a combined method of oral historical survey and an in-depth research and summed up all the materials and models uh, re regarding the uh, political and the trade union movements in, in, uh, in, in the Kerala economy uh, with the special, uh, with the focus in tune with the socio-economic and the political climate of Kerala. Uh, in his, uh, 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 I think in almost all his uh, writings and discussions, he always dis uh, focused on the development of uh, uh, India uh, as well as the Kerala economy. Now, uh, today's speaker, Professor uh, Lekha Chakravarti, is a great competitive scholar, uh, a contributor of India's uh, public policy. Most of us are familiar with her writings and speech, an apt person to speak in the Professor Ramachandran Nair Memorial Lecture. And now, I take this opportunity to appreciate the initi initiatives of Dr. Manju S. Nair for conducting the program. Once again, I welcome each one of you being here about, here at, uh, with us uh, for this event. Thank you all. Okay, thank you, Dr. Anita. So now I invite uh, Professor Lekha Chakrabarti for uh, the memorial lecture. And she'll speak on COVID-19 and the macroeconomic policy responses. So over to you, Dr. Leka. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manju. And, uh, you know, uh, my special thanks to you and uh, Professor Anita for having me for this, you know, important event in the department. And uh, it's my privilege and honor to deliver the uh, memorial lecture uh, you know, Professor K. Ramachandran Nair Memorial Lecture. Uh, of, he was my teacher. He was my first supervisor. As you mentioned, I worked on my first piece of research, which uh, it's a part of the analytical economics course we have done in the department. And, you know, uh, as uh, Professor Anita pointed out, he, his core uh, or a topic very close to his heart was industrial economics or industrial relations. So when... Uh, sir asked us as a part of analytical economics course to work on a topic, you know, I read his thesis and, uh, you know, I thought that uh, I will do a dissertation which is close to that. And I talked to Sir that I will work with you and I'm going to work on the topic, which is your thesis that is on industrial relations. And, you know, the way he guided me, uh, you know, that helped me. And in the distance, in the journey, which I covered in the area of research, you know, that handholding and that kindness and the intelligence uh, in which, you know, Sir has guided me, that helped me a lot. And that was my first piece of research. And it is very special because my classmate, you know, Manju, invited me for this program. I know that uh, she has gone through a very bad time uh, due to COVID. And I hope that Purvadhyam Shaktamaita, 
മഞ്ജു തിരിച്ച് ഡിപ്പാർട്ട്മെന്റിൽ വന്ന് കുട്ടികളെ പഠിപ്പിച്ച യുനോ എവറിങ് വിൽ ബി ഓൾ റൈറ്റ് ദറ്റ്സ് വാട്ട് ഐ വാസ് ടെലിങ് ഹർ ആൻഡ് യുനോ ദറ്റ്സ് ഡെഫിനറ്റ്ലി ഗോയിങ് ടു ഹാപ്പൻ ആൻഡ് ബി കോൺഫിഡൻറ്റ് മഞ്ജു ആൻഡ് നൗ യുനോ മഞ്ജു ആസ് മീ ടു ടോക്ക് ഓൺ കോവിഡ് നയൻറ്റീൻ ആൻഡ് ദ മാക്രോ ഇക്കണോമിക് പോളിസി ഫ്രെയിം വർക്ക് uh you know when i think about the topic uh, and one moment you know i do recognize the presence of sindhu chichi and uh, nc and thank you so much for you know being here and i do remember my visit to your place in maridakat uh, you know long time back thank you so much for being okay. here thank you uh you know uh, my topic of conversation today is macroeconomic framework of covid 19 so when i talk about the macroeconomic uh, framework or the macroeconomic uncertainty you know in the times of covid-19 pandemic this uncertainty which we are dealing with this is very hard to measure so what macroeconomist used is the variable output gap to capture this uncertainty and output gap is a very controversial concept output gap is the difference between the actual output and the potential output and the potential output the way we arrive at it's an unobserved variable the way we arrive at the potential output that econometric methodology and the concept everything is controversial so there is an increasing concern about the way we measure the potential output by decomposing output into trends and cycles you know but the contextual topic here is is business cycle always operate in the context of emerging economies like india the answer is a big no and you must have read in the writings of the you know former chief economist geeta gopinath uh, with mark you know the title of that paper is cycle is trend so in many cases you know in the context of emerging countries or the emerging economies business cycle is not always a cycle the cycle could be the trend so when macroeconomic crisis or the recession especially in the context of covid-19 pandemic when it tried to permanently push down the level of country's gdp then in it is inappropriate to assume that you know the output will bounce back to the previous levels that's exactly why it is argued that the output is you know this output gap that concept is ill measured so you can take a look into the valeria and saxena a paper in imf and that paper highlights that the significance of hysteresis hysteresis is a kind of dependence of economic path on history so that framework of hysteresis is better than the framework of business cycles when we talk about deep recessions and crises this is my point number 1 which you know you can ask me clarifications or questions when we when manju open you know open the floor for discussion now comes the second point this persistence of the sluggish growth and this weak economic recovery you know this, this is a matter of concern even prior to the pandemic for instance in 19, in 2009 uh, you know if you look at the economic report of us president of 2009 that council of economic advisers we have seen in their report that recessions are not followed by quick rebounds so all what we are thinking right now is we are going to get a v shaped or a u shaped economic recovery the moment monetary policy and fiscal policy act as counter cyclical policy tools but you know if you only focus on the cyclicality elements then we are not going to get a quick rebound to a v shaped or a q shaped recovery and the inequality is widening like anything so we have to think beyond the economic growth paradigm that's a point number 2 now Uh, of course this output gap is a crucial variable and that we have used in the macroeconomic policy making both by the central banks and by the fiscal authorities because you must be knowing that in 2000 uh, you know 16 we have gone towards a new monetary policy framework in the context of india so as per the new monetary policy framework rbi has to focus only on price stability as the single criteria of the monetary policy stance so in that transition 
uh, from you know using the discretion of the policy maker prior to that towards a rules based a kind of inflation targeting framework you know you can appreciate that when the macroeconomic policy framework is rules based then you know the the flexibility of the policy to maneuver in especially in the context of crisis like you know economic crisis or pandemic that is very limited and on the economic uh, policy from the fiscal front that is also very much rules based in the context of india because we know that we have a fiscal consolidation path and we have to maintain a threshold you know deficit to gdp at 3% now let's unpack the monetary policy and fiscal policy one by one because you know now the topic of conversation uh, you know in rbi and in north block and among the you know ministry of finance at the state level is going towards a normalization procedure normalization procedure in the sense all what we have announced as the economic stimulus packages they are short run now the time has come to go or you know to roll back this short run you know economic stimulus packages which we have announced but is this a right time what is the timing to go for a normalization procedure that's the crucial concern right now in the policy circle why it is so tough to go for a normalization procedure right now let's unpack the packages you know monetary and fiscal and uh, then i will be able to explain to you why it's tough what has happened on the monetary policy front we have reduced the repo rate to 4% and kept it constant and it is so crucial to keep you know the nominal interest rate at 4% because if you increase the rate of interest this moment it can lead to you know little bit of it's problematic for a growth recovery process of course this growth recovery and repo rate reduction that is not one to one there are many other determinants also factor in the moment you talk about economic recovery but monetary policy it has done a heavy lifting not only in terms of repo rate but also in terms of liquidity infusion into the economy so uh, you know all what it takes to that's a narrative you know there, there was a lot of it, it, what whatever it happened it was a heavy lifting but monetary policy has got its own limitations you know monetary policy also try to nudge the commercial banks to go for a lending process to go for a credit offtake but you when you look at the numbers uh, you know repo rate repo rate is a rate in which the commercial banks park their liquidity or excess liquidity with the central bank so despite all this nudging process what we have seen in the recent data when we analyzed this you know the banks have the tendency to keep their or to part their you know funds back to the rbi and that trend is quite high and credit deployment or credit offtake has not happened the way we wanted it to happen now let's unpack in the context of the global central banks look at uh, you know a fed reserve uh, they have they have gone towards reduction in the interest rate but they have to grapple also with not exactly the fed bank they have not reached a zero bound but there are many central banks which also deal with zero bound interest rates or even in some countries interest rate is even negative so when your interest rate is zero bound or interest rate is negative then you know the kind of uh, policy maneuvering you do through the interest rate to trigger the economy that is also limited and that a kind of liquidity trap you are all aware of this liquidity trap concept that's why you know we have to give emphasis to fiscal policy or fiscal dominance is quite crucial to tackle with the pandemic now see the way global uh, or uh, across countries how we have tackled the crisis Uh, in 2007 a global financial crisis and the pandemic if you look at the 2007 uh, you know after that the exit strategy in the exit strategy you know importance or significance was given to monetary policy and we lost a chance then uh, to go for a fiscal dominance but right now the fiscal dominance is given you know uh, importance that is very crucial but at the same time in the time of pandemic in the time of you know revenue uncertainties what is the fiscal space available to you that is again a crucial question 
United Nations Secretary General has announced that in the in the in, when, when the pandemic broke out, he announced that the member countries we have to go for at least. 10% threshold to GDP as our economic stimulus package program. But that doesn't happen, you know, just because of the restraints with the fiscal space. Because the size of government is very important the moment you talk about designing your uh, you know, economic stimulus packages. At the same time, revenue stability and expenditure design, these are also closely linked. So th that's why, you know, Government of India has not gone for a macro fiscal stimulus announcement, just like the way, you know, Treasury Secretary of U.S. Janet Allen has announced. We have not gone for a macro fiscal huge stimulus program like that. Instead of that, it was very targeted, you know, a mini series of budget kind of very targeted kind of, you know, fiscal stimulus programs. But whether that was effective or not, you know, when we open the flow, you know, we, we can debate about those components in the economic stimulus program, whether that intended benefits were there or, you know, we missed certain elements in uh, when we designed the, uh, you know, what you call the economic stimulus program from the uh, fiscal front. But the fiscal dominance is very crucial because right now the global environment is also crucial for the MPC, the Monetary Policy Committee, to take decisions in the sense if they don't increase the interest rate right now, there could be an anticipated uh, you know, capital flight. Why I'm saying this? Because you, know, you, must be, uh, you must have read in newspapers about taper tantrum. That means they will go ahead with, you know, tapering a process in the sense after the global financial crisis, the excess liquidity, which is there in the system right now, what Fed is focusing is to go for reducing the balance sheet of US Fed in the sense they will not have huge bond purchase program and they will not have huge printing of money in the sense, you know, it's a monetization process. So when they go for reducing the balance sheet uh, you know invariably the interest rate or the fed interest rate will go up and you know that a, a considerable element of the capital in our country the foreign capital in our country the portfolio the hot money that will respond to the interest rate differentials so hot money by definition you know that respond to interest rates high interest rates so in order to prevent that capital being flighty you have to keep the interest rate high. So this is the policy dilemma. And in this policy dilemma, all what I could decipher from the recent MPC meetings is that, you know, they are giving importance to growth first, the internal growth process, the GDP, growth recovery. That's why, you know, there is no announcement for an increasing uh, interest rate at this moment. And the monetary policy transmission mechanism is equally crucial. Otherwise, a keeping repo rate at 4% is not everything. You know, if, if your monetary policy transmission mechanism doesn't work out, and if this policy rate doesn't get into, you know, the rates decided by the commercial banks, it, it will not reach the consumers. This is one thing. The term structure of interest rate, the relationship between the short run rate of interest and the long term rate of interest, that is term structure of interest rate, that's very crucial. And why there is an urgency for normalization procedure? Because you have seen the repercussions in the money market, the call money market rates are below the repo rate. And on the other hand, long term, uh, you know, rate of interest in the gilded securities market also, you have seen the repercussions that, uh, you know, the rates are going haywire, especially for about 15 years uh, bond yield. So there are problems, but at the same time, they cannot go for a normalization procedure right now. We thought that there will be a, an announcement of increasing the repo rate as a part of the normalization procedure. But that has not happened. Only a segment, you know, that uh, uh, triple V, that uh, variable rate of interest for a very small se segment only, they have announced a little bit of hike. Otherwise, the repo rate was also kept constant. So that's, that's a story about, uh, you know, the monetary policy. Uh, that, that's a story about the liquidity infusion. And liquidity infusion was attempted through many methodologies. And one thing which is crucial was operation twist. An operation twist announced by, you know, Dr. Shaktikan Das was like, 
it is simultaneous buying and selling of you know securities in the sense you simultaneously sell short term securities and buy long term securities in the process you go for an elongation of the maturity structure of the bond market in which the refinancing risk can be postponed because you have to go back to a robust growth path there you know you cannot uh, have you know short term because you need to you know buy time that's why the elongation of maturity structure of the bond market was done through the operation twist but all but said and done this uh, you know monetary policy has got huge limitations in triggering the economic growth recovery and that we have to you know keep in mind now comes the question of what can be done on the uh, fiscal policy front and uh, you know in the american economic association conference prior to the pandemic in 2019 in his presidential address you know oliver blanche you must be knowing him very well uh, oliver blanche he mentioned that go for high public debt or high fiscal deficit in the times of recession because in the time of recession public debt has no fiscal cost especially if the real rate of interest is not greater than the real growth of economy so here the two crucial variables are r and g so this argument is a little different than the fiscal rules based argument the fiscal rules based argument is you keep a threshold level of fiscal deficit in your country to gdp that is your 3% but this is not based on a threshold ratio of deficit at 3% that kind of an argument here the argument is little different using two macro variables r and g the real rate of interest and the real growth of economy so you grow out of your debt that's the way he argued and in these these writings are there from the times of domer i understand that you know you grow out of your debt what is r r is your cost of credit and g is a growing growth rate of your economy so if you're growing out of your debt you know there is no problem in having high levels of debt so that's what otherwise if you go for a deficit control or a debt control in the times of pandemic that will have adverse consequences on the level of economic growth recovery so what he argued was that what he highlighted was that public debt is not catastrophic if more debt can be justified by clear benefits like public investment you enhance your public investment because public infrastructure investment is very crucial in crowding in private corporate investment so don't fear about you know that uh, what do you call as uh, credit rating agencies or investors confidence or animal spirits because if you look at any model for the private corporate investment in the context of india you get the significant variable you know uh, of determining the private corporate investment is public investment especially public infrastructure investment of course the interest rates and the other variables related to you know uh, determining the pu- public private corporate investment is not as you know significant as your public investment so if you can support high fiscal deficit by arguing that you are doing it you are substantiating that you are keeping this high fiscal deficit but in turn you are enhancing your public investment then go for it otherwise you substantiate that you are going for output gap reduction sectorally you are using this you know high fiscal deficit but you have to reduce your output gap but this is a tricky argument because as i mentioned output gap that concept is a little uh, tricky in the sense it looks into the cyclicality so uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy acting as a counter cyclical fiscal policy or counter cyclical monetary policy or the public policy that is not enough to tackle the pandemic that's why when you unpack the stimulus packages economic stimulus packages you can see that there are two important elements to it one is the kind of five fighting we have to do and for this five fighting we have to keep the high fiscal deficit to gdp ratio and you can see in the recent union budget a uh, reason in the sense we are about to you know announce the next uh, budget in february reason in the sense of 2021 202021 uh the fiscal deficit of gdp was 9.5% 
can you imagine this whether when the threshold ratio was just 3% but you know from the position of strength finance minister argued that don't fear deficit in the time of pandemic because it is very crucial to have high spending because we cannot say revenue spending is bad in times of recession in times of pandemic because this is a dual crisis it's a health crisis and macroeconomic crisis so to prevent this health crisis mounting into prolonged macroeconomic crisis or prolonged financial crisis it is very important to keep you know your revenue spending high by providing enough spending in health sector in education sector especially vaccination and to tackle with the digital divide so many elements with relate to capital not capital the revenue spending is crucial so along with the capital infrastructure you know don't say revenue spending is bad in the times of pandemic you have to go for enhanced revenue spending in the time of pandemic one moment now comes the question why this 9.5% you know it is not entirely new expenditure priorities in the time of pandemic it's not for the new expenditure design entirely it was also the part of budget transparency because i know that this is a huge political economy question why certain elements of borrowing are not appearing as a part of your fiscal deficit you announced in the budget it's a huge political economy question why the finance minister is innovating sources of financing deficit and it, this is also due to you know the fiscal consolidation path when we have a strict fiscal consolidation path in which you have to keep the 3% of gdp fiscal deficit and also you have to phase out your revenue deficit that's very crucial you know as a part of this fiscal rules there is a golden principle and what is a golden principle all what you have in terms of your revenues exp revenue receipts use it for your revenue spending but nothing more than that that means all what you borrow will entirely go for capital infrastructure creation or the gross capital formation so that's the argument of this golden principle but this is quite restrictive because certain part of borrowing we need for the revenue spending as well because certain kind of revenue spending can also be capital creating in nature in the long run so this strict division and there was a huge argument within the policy makers within the frbm the fiscal responsibility and management uh, act you know when they amended that in 2018 it was a huge issue and uh, former uh, you know chief economic advisor professor arvin subramaniam mentioned that we have to go towards primary deficit as the operational parameter for the fiscal policy not the fiscal deficit but that argument was not well taken and he put a decent note his argument was that primary deficit is a concept which focuses on the current fiscal policy stance so your ex interest rate is exogenous and your interest payments that is a past you know government's liability or it's a past liability so if you are going to focus on the current fiscal policy stance go for primary deficit but that was not well taken and you can read that decent note and his arguments in frbm and uh, right now the the moment you open your budget documents at the center and the state you can understand that fiscal deficit is a operational parameter of government that's why certain elements of borrowing that happen through you know the off budget borrowings that is what we call you know this this component that happen through public sector entities and corporate bodies that's not by definition it's not a part of fiscal deficit and it's kept outside and it it became a huge political economy question that why finance minister is innovating sources of financing the capital spending uh, and you know it it's like a, the argument is based on the fiscal consolidation part itself but another political economy question is what are the ways in which the subnational governments you know found this fiscal space uh, in context of kerala we have gone to london market for a masala bond that is a rupee denominated bond in the context of telangana as i mentioned earlier they have gone for an elongation of the maturity structure 
of the bond market in the sense there uh, you know if you look at the debt pattern you know it's like uh, all what they have is like above 40 years uh, bonds so the refinancing risk is postponed because as it was a new state high growth was you know entirely that was very crucial for them and they have gone so different states innovated in different manner in, in to finance the deficit now what is the entire narrative of this fiscal stimulus package or the economic stimulus package in the context of india it was a credit narrative we thought that the supply side economics we thought that the credit offtake or the credit deployment or the liquidity infusion can do wonder wonders and not you know we didn't believe in the fiat money you must have uh, you know some of you must have read the work by turner the debt or devil you know in between debt or devil in that work also this point is highlighted why nations do believe that it is the credit that is a magic variable for a growth recovery and not fiat money it's a huge debate in the context of india right now because we cannot announce that we are going for a fiscal austerity measure because we don't have fiscal space we have to identify the fiscal space but at the same time financing pattern of deficit is crucial to identify your fiscal space in the sense the importance to the fiat money the importance to synergy financing this is a debate and on one side professor koshik basu uh, professor abhijit banerji and you know that uh, uh, kotak mahendra so they were all you know emphasizing that we can go for a little bit of synergy financing but at the same time fiscal economist you know they were uh, very uh, you know i don't know whether it's an error on the side of caution but they anticipate a kind of fiscal profligacy the moment we talk about you know synergy financing of deficit synergy the sense you know it is not only uh, that it, it, it is not only because uh, you know it's not a new mode of financing deficit because you know this was a kind of financing that has happened you must be remembering you know uh, in, in manju and me our uh, you know childhood days but not you it's be prior to uh, you know your era uh, we had this deficit financing in the sense we had ad hoc treasury bills and through the ad hoc treasury bills we financed the deficit but in this process the fiscal dominance the fiscal policy maker is a first mover and the monetary policy follows and you know that led to the fiscal profligacy in the late 80s that's why we controlled monetized deficit but right now my argument was that a finite money financing a fiscal program that is we call it as mfft why can't we do that in the sense can't it be tied to a certain fiscal program you announce uh, like the money financing of the fiscal program like government acting as an employer of last resort or government coming up with targeted cash transfers to tackle the livelihood process why can't you do that and that is finite but you know you have to think about fiscal marksmanship this moment in the sense we have tax projections expenditure projections and the actual spending or the actual tax or actual tax we realized after one year if you look at this gap there are uh, fiscal forecasting errors that happen between budget estimates and the realized spending or you know revenue why this significant deviation the moment you open this synergy financing you know uh, fiscal economists they feel that can it open a flood gate to correct the fiscal marksmanship issues because the moment your tax projections go haywire will you you know succumb to this monetization of deficit kind of a path will it lead to ultimately lead to a fiscal profligacy will it lead to inflationary pressures in the economy which we cannot manage in future so these are the concerns but you know there are two parts basically if you from the theoretical perspective if you look at you must have read the works of nobel laureate uh, you know uh, sarjan and valis he talks about an unpleasant monetary arithmetic path on the other hand the chicago school of thought they talk about an unpleasant fiscal arithmetic path so the moment we talk about the macroeconomic framework or the response to covid pandemic 
the financing of the deficit or that question that happened from the paradigm of unpleasant monetary arithmetic in the sense unpleasant monetary arithmetic speaks about uh, your rng also the real rate of interest and the growth of economy so you can go ahead with bond financing of your deficit only till the moment your r is less than g so when your r is greater than g then you have to eventually monetize your deficit so that's the concern so that's why you call your monetary arithmetic here is unpleasant now what is fiscal arithmetic why the fiscal uh, arithmetic is unpleasant what is that they believe in central bank independence but if you look at rbi rbi doesn't have independence in that way because th there is no goal independence the operational independence is there in the sense now it's not the rbi governor that's announcing the programs it instead of that we have a committee monetary policy committee and uh, you know that operational independence is there based on the voting process you know you come up with your rate status quo or up or down you, the decisions are based on your monetary policy committee decision so you have an operational independence to a limited level it's not exactly the central bank independence so that's why here fiscal arithmetic is unpleasant because the moment you think about a central bank independence uh, i don't think that in the context of india that will that's ever going to happen even you know the times of uh, rakram rajan also we talked about that a lot but it is more or less a kind of a unpleasant monetary arithmetic that's that's happening in the context of india now uh what are the components of economic stimulus packages so from the framework of macro uh, policy uh, you know that analytical framework we talk about the output gap now let's get into the components of course the paradigm was economic growth and if you unpack the economic stimulus packages across countries you can see that economic growth was given priorities but the times of humanitarian crisis like pandemic if you depend on economic growth your paradigm you're not getting to degree that's why going economic equal importance as i mentioned to the empire of societies by government because everything else failed in the crisis of pandemic right so the government has to come and act as employer of last resort and you can read the works of uh, pavlina uh, the faculty of uh, levy economic associate Le Le levy economic institute you know manju mentioned about that uh, you know pavlina has a book uh, on job guarantee we didn't realize the importance of job guarantee years back when maharashtra government they were the first to announce that employment policy is everything to tackle you know your humanitarian crisis and poverty they announced then it was scaled up then the public action translated into public policy and based on the works of john dres uh, you know you remember that uh, rights based uh, you know many policy making happened at that time and one of the important rights based policy framework was government acting as an elr employer of last resort and in the time of pandemic this is a crucial question whether basic income is important or participation income is important as a policy narrative participation income means the government designed the policy in such a manner uh, like like the way i mentioned the employer of last resort in which people participate in the economy and earn an income but basic income you know that was a pet topic of professor arvin subramanian when he was a ceo he mentioned that we have to go for universal basic income it is even prior to the pandemic he was focusing on income transfers into the hands of people but of course a judicious mix is important right now because there is livelihood crisis because employment opportunities are drying up but the argument against government going for a huge macro fiscal program uh, in terms of this uh, cash transfers into the hands of people you know vidakram rajan also mentioned you must have read read his uh you know arguments uh it is like this if the propensity to save among people is higher than the propensity to spend then your cash transfers cannot stimulate the economy so that's the argument and uh, you know this can be refuted but that's the argument and maybe an error instead of caution that uh, we are not doing this but this argument is that it's based on the propensity to save 
if the people have the propensity to save rather than the uh, propensity to spend, you know, then your things will not work. But at the same time, we, we have not yet announced anything substantial to trigger the demand side of economy, the demand management. So that, that's a lack, you know, it's a flaw. Uh, in the economic stimulus packages we announced so far. And the second uh, point is it's over emphasis on growth, growth recovery. But, you know, in the long term, human capital formation and emphasis on the four elements, which I was mentioning, one is the government acting as an employer of last resort. And the second point I mentioned about the digital divide and the importance of investing in health because of a health spending is just around 1% of GDP. But we have not, it, uh, you know, started thinking about the importance of investing in health, the way it ha has to happen. So that social infrastructure, that's the second point. So one is employer of last resort. The second is a social infrastructure policies. And third element is food security. And of course, government of Kerala has done that. It was like along with emphasizing the economic growth, uh, you know, we have given a lot of importance to the food security and that that's quite crucial. It was not a uh, sequential kind of an announcement within the life versus livelihood framework. That's a pandemic economics. We have done a simultaneous process of announcing all these humanitarian elements along with this, you know, growth recovery elements. And the fourth one is social protection measures. And social protection in the context of India, it is not there, uh, you know, uh, so we need to strengthen the social protection measures as well in the time of pandemic. And in addition to these four elements of social protection, social infrastructure, food security and government acting as an employer of last resort, another important area is we giving, uh, we have to give, uh, you know, importance to the climate change crisis. And you know that the Glasgow meetings is, you know, uh, the kind of sensitive arguments of phasing out coal or phase down coal. So in that decision, you know, we have gone towards phase down, not phase out coal, because that's a major source of energy in the context of developing countries. So that's, that's a very sensitive area, because if we are committing for, you know, the climate change uh, that uh, you will, uh, you know, go ahead with this threshold by this time span, within this time span, then the cold, that's a very sensitive, uh, you know, area. And, uh, uh, you know, and uh, we don't know. We we thought that uh, it's going to be a complete announcement that it's going to be, you know, phased out completely. And uh, then, you know, it's very crucial for the countries like India that we have to go for a just transition. And this is a very important area of research, upcoming research, just transition, you know, we have to transit to more safe or, you know, environmental friendly sources of energy, but the transition has to be a just transition. And there, the question regarding the climate change commitments are very crucial. Here again, can we unpack monetary policy and fiscal policy? Monetary policy, uh, of course, RBI is on board. They have announced a kind of policies. You can the chat, uh, uh, you know, RBI publication, they gave emphasis of greening the monetary policy. And you can see the works of, uh, you know, Christine Lagarde in the context of European, uh, you know, Centre Bank. She announced that it is very crucial to go for greening of monetary policy. But at the same time, economists are divided on this. Uh, you know, Rekhanam Rajan and, um, you know, my friend in uh, Sesai for Munich, uh, you know, uh, Clements Fused, uh, you know, these economists, they argue that if the primary focus or the objective of the monetary policy is price stability and financial stability, don't mess up with that. But then that point can be refuted because your climate financing or the climate change risk that affects financial stability. That's why, you know, Bank of England was the first ever, has gone ahead with, uh, you know, a kind of green stress test to the top banks. So in the, in the financial invest, financing investment decisions, uh, you know, they uh, asked them to go for this green stress test. And, uh, uh, you know, I don't know what RBA stands on that, but RBA is quite positive about greening of monetary policy. Kramraj's point was that uh, if the financial stability is the prime concern, then go for a political economy decision like differentiating green bond 
and brown bond when it comes to the investment decisions those kind of political economy decisions have to be taken by the fiscal policy maker so it has to be more fiscal than monetary when you think about your climate change commitments related policy you can argue about that also or think about it and i know that a student uh, with manju she's working on a greening of monetary policy if my if my memory is correct you can correct me later uh, so that's a very important field of research now uh fiscal policy how you can uh, respond to the climate change commitments uh, we don't have a macro framework for climate financing in india yet we have not announced a kind of climate responsive budgeting and yesterday was you know that expert uh, panel uh, you know the pre budget uh, meeting uh, that happened yesterday uh, with the honorable finance minister of kerala so i, I you know uh, i was privy to the discussions and maybe the point i highlighted there was this climate responsive budgeting in the state of kerala because we know that there are huge risk we have a humanitarian crisis we have covid crisis on the top of that we have disasters we have climate change uh, issues sea rise so this is the right time in which you know the government can go ahead with the framework the road map about the climate financing or the climate responsive budgeting because most of the components are mitigation about the mitigation but adaptation is equally important so what is that uh, you know that is very crucial when it comes to the climate financing and principle of subsidiarity that is very crucial in the case of you know climate change commitments principle of subsidiarity in the sense the decisions have to happen at the level of the government which is closest to the people the fiscal decentralization is very crucial here at the decentralized levels of government you know things should happen not at the top level or it should not be one size fits all uh, you know in the environmental federalism uh, thought process it should not be a one size fits all process so these are the crucial elements uh, manju uh, maybe uh, the next part of my lecture i can talk to the students and respond to their questions over to you no yes thank you thank you thank you so much uh, dr leka for your uh, useful lecture i think it's uh, time is now 5:23 and it's now time for interaction uh, participants uh, particularly students are requested to raise their queries i think uh, tom thomasar has raised their hand sir you can start yeah it was an enlightening uh, lecture actually uh, ramendran sir is uh, one of my uh, very Uh, good teachers i studied in karivattam uh, in 89 91 so okay. uh, it was an enlightening lecture but some of the issues i think you must have uh, probably missed uh, or maybe least more discussion for example uh, the why in indian indian economy uh, after all this pumping of money uh, the uh, market uh money in the market is still not uh, it's a big concern because in the informal market the money is very some of one of the very important issue for example i was just comparing how the digital economy has created a new paradigm in terms of uh blocking money at different ends most of the funding that government has announced in this uh, pandemic time that money has been blocked at different places you just compare just between prime minister jandan yojana and mudra yojana how much money is there lying in the different banks and how much money is dispersed this is just uh, two two different schemes have to i uh, addressing similar uh, population groups so what do you feel about uh, because in india the main problem now is the lack of money and there is no money in the in the market so what are the issues which surrounding what are the policies at the macro level which could enhance the uh, the availability of money or availability of cash with the common man uh thank you thank you professor tom i'll respond to your question after hearing to your colleagues and students let me take all the questions now so that you know we can listen to more students and faculty members and then i will come back and respond to your question and your friends questions okay. thank you yeah thank you go ahead questions
It was a pleasure Good to listen evening. to your lecture. Uh, um, I have three queries. Uh, you had said that the same propensity among people would be greater than the propensity to spend during this crisis time. So in that case, as the aggregate demand among people would be less, uh, wouldn't it be better to resort to seniorage financing rather than credit financing? And my other doubt is, um, as you said, the revenue spending is crucial during pandemics. Uh, should the government prioritize in uh, the infrastructure or the sectors in which the public investment need to be done with? And also uh, regarding participation income, uh, if it is not possible to employ universal basic income, uh, wouldn't it be better to go for emergency basic income uh, for a short period of while during this uh, crisis? That's all. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I, 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 one moment. You know, uh, I got a message from Professor Tom that he needs to log out in five minutes. Um, so maybe, uh, you know, his concern about that informal sector, uh, maybe I will respond to that because he just sent a message, uh, you know, uh, that he needs to log out in five minutes. So your concerns are real, uh, Professor Tom, but, you know, all what I want to say is that the impact of this pandemic on the informal sector, uh, you know, only this empirical evidence we started, you know, uh, but... Uh, what's a way, what's a data uh, you, you you are talking about the moment you talk about this, uh, you know, informal sector? That is one question. Second, the way people tackle this data process, you know, I have read a work by uh, Tarun Jain, uh, you know, uh, he, the, he's from IM Ahmedabad uh, and he has a caller from RBI. They have used, you know, this nightlight intensity to capture the informal sector the impact of this COVID on the informal sector and how it has affected the economic growth recovery process. So the data that that's that's uh, you know not uh, there. So the way you know people work on the informal sector, the impact of the COVID on the informal sector, that crisis uh, you know uh, that that's there. That's my first point about the data and the methodological methodology concerns. The second point is. Uh, you know, the moment uh, we, uh, you know, talk about this uh, digital infrastructure or the kind of, you know, the digital economy, there are concerns regarding cost of credit versus access to credit. So all thought in the process of this development economics is that the cost of credit was only relevant. Uh, that's why, you know, your point is very crucial that it is not the cost of credit it is the access to the credit and the access to money that is very crucial than the cost of credit. But if you look at the pandemic economics, the way the monetary policy stands, we announced the cost of credit to be less, that is the interest rate. So our focus was on the cost of credit, but not on the access to the credit. But of course, as you mentioned, there is a digital infrastructure. We have opened bank accounts. You know, we are not thinking that the poor are not unbankable clients anymore. They have opened the, you know, Jantan accounts and all. But at the same time, in the implementation level, this access to credit is a concern and money is a concern. I do accept that. But there are two levels in which we have to an analyze the pandemic economics. One is the macro policy responses. The second is the implementation issues and what is happening at the ground level. And uh, we are waiting for, you know, we just announced this economic policy packages. So your question is about the impact and the implementation and the things happening at the ground level. And uh, those kind of impact analysis, I think it is just begun and we don't have any study regarding the impact of economic, uh, what you call the stimulus package on you know what is the impact of this and we are waiting for these numbers to be on board and even the fiscal marksmanship announcement you know you are talking about outcome but even if you look at the financial inputs whether what is announced is even translated into you know actual spending then comes the question of you know the outcome so even that analysis i think we are waiting uh, a little more maybe one more year to go ahead with that we don't have any studies regarding the fiscal marksmanship or the uh, at the local level or at the you know field level regarding the 
uh, macro policy stimulus we have announced. And one more point I would like to highlight, your, your concern is real. There is a disconnect between real economy and financial economy. And you can see that in the finance sector, uh, you know, the financial exuberance is there, but there is a disconnect between the real sector and the financial sector. And thank you so much for raising these valid concerns. And I hope that uh, maybe in this year or in the coming year, you know, this implementation issues and what has happened at the ground level, that kind of empirical evidence, uh, you know, the studies which I may be able to, uh, you know, quote and substantiate my points. But so far, you know, the people have not, the scholars have not looked into the informal sector, uh, you know, uh, those, those kind of studies. And one thing I found a macro level is this, nightlight intensity and you can understand the limitations of using satellite data uh, you know for studying the informal sector we know the limitations but that's a way it is uh, done uh, you know these are limitations regarding the data now uh, coming to the question of um, there are a lot of questions that we need to thank you so much so you we can have a one-to-one -one discussions over a cup of tea when I come down to Trivantrum, or you can also, you know, talk to me over my email. Uh, Manju knows, uh, you know, my email address, and she can, uh, you know, you can share with Professor Tom. And thank you so much for joining. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Now let me go ahead with Sharon's question. Uh, she has three concerns. Uh, one is uh, the propensity to save, uh, you know, uh, that question, and second is the importance of uh, revenue spending and uh, sporadic or very sectoral infrastructure spending. And third is her concern about, you know, emphasizing the participation income. And of course, Sharon, your concerns are real. Like uh, we have to give a little bit of targeted emphasis to the basic income as it's a kind of, you know, uh, what do you call the kind of uh, uh, uncertainty we go through because these are extraordinary times. Otherwise, you know, if you ask a heterodox economist, you know that there are two kinds of economists, like the orthodox, like a World Bank IMF and the heterodox, you know, serious training. We have this heterodox economist training. And uh, Dr. Ramachandran sir, I do remember here, the moment I talk about economist language, uh, you know, uh, Sharon has spoken, uh, she has that economist language. And after our YY 1993, right, Manju, 1995, after our viva, you know, he was giving his feedback about his experiment. Uh, his experiment was, you know, transition towards an analytical economics course from uh, PG in economics. So he was so happy, uh, you know, after uh, the uh, conducting viva, I mean, after our batch, you know, he mentioned that the kind of economist language my students now speak, you know, this is exactly, uh, you know, what I wanted to happen, you know, when he has done this experiment towards analytical economics and giving importance to the contemporary public policy perspectives and the contemporary research, you know, he wanted us to do a research, a piece of research in six months, you know, his dream was that kind of, you know, occurring an economist language. And uh, when we students started speaking the economist language, he was so, it was so satisfying for him. So when you speak, you know, Sharon, uh, I remembered Sir's words that as a student, uh, you have to, you know, you have to develop the skills of speaking economist language. And that was a training, you know, Sir, uh, you know, wanted us to develop in the course of our journey. And uh, you have spoken, you know, your language is an economist language. And uh, I, I remember, Sir, you know, when I heard that economist language, when you spoke and your concerns about universal basic income you know in the times of pandemic it is crucial but if you look at the studies you know the countries which focused on basic income you know when the moment you ask the people they were not satisfied with basic income the people who were given the cash transfers they also wanted to have a job uh, an employment guarantee, uh, you know, that, that's the reality. And you can read the works uh, or the book by Pavlina, uh, the job guarantee. Uh, so in that, you know, heterodox economists, if you ask what is a solution for any crisis, you know, their focus is on employment policy. So why the government should guarantee employment, job guarantee. So, you know, those kind of perspectives you will understand the moment you read about this literature based on the 
job guarantee, the employment guarantee. It's a huge literature. And they believe that, you know, the participation of people in the economic activity is quite crucial. And uh, that uh, income, that, that's a long-term policy perspective, but the universal basic income can be quite shorter. That, that's my point. Now, coming to this question regarding uh, revenue spending versus, uh, you know, infrastructure spending. Of course, it is both. Uh, you know, I mentioned about two important components of the pandemic package. One is a firefighting and instantaneous. So there the spending, the revenue spending is crucial. The other is long term, the structural reforms. You know, structural reforms in the sense, uh, you know, your power sector reforms, that is structural nature labor market reforms that is structural nature so we use this pandemic this crisis as an opportunity to float many structural reforms as well right but uh, labor reforms of course the uh, you know uh, the dissatisfaction is that it should have been based on more consultative processes uh, and uh, power sector reforms you know that i have a study with my colleague amandeep kaur it's there in the epw a few weeks back or it, I think two weeks back, you can take a look into the power sector reforms and even the extra borrowing power that is decided on the basis of the performance indicator related to the power sector reforms at the state level. So power sector is coming up as a very crucial uh, you know, element uh, when we talk about the structural reforms. But our analysis based on the data from the Ministry of Power, you know, it was based on the tripartite agreement we floated the non-SLR bonds, you know, but the agreement is that the state governments can guarantee all what is happening in this uh, mess happening in this discourse, the distribution companies. And you know that story, Sharon, like we have enough power generation in our country to go for 100% electrification of villages. But at the same time, the distribution companies are in loss. That's exactly the reason why we are not able to do that. So what, ha what has to be done there? There, you know, this discoms companies' losses and all, the state government gave the guarantee. And, you know, we gave certain financial and operational parameters for them to perform. Financial parameters in the sense they have to reduce the aggregate technical and commercial loss. They have to reduce the gap between the aggregate cost and revenue. They have to go for the tariff revisions. Then a lot of infrastructure related smart meters and everything to, you know, uh, to assess these financial parameters. But if we look at the indicators, you get different pictures across states. Some states are doing very well. But some states, in spite of all these things, you know, now state governments, uh, you know, state finances are in, uh, you know, mess after supporting these discounts. But at the same time, we have not yet done the course correction related to the financial parameters and the operational parameters. So these are concerns, but structural reforms are very crucial in power sector, in labor reforms. And of course, another problem is a twin balance sheet crisis. Uh, you know, you know that the bank, that cleansing process is happening, the corporate debt. It's not only that, you know, public debt. So in that process also recapit, uh, what do you call it? recapitalize the thing to reach up to the capital adequacy norm based on the basal norms. We have done that, but, uh, you know, uh, recapitalization means that is a kind of a mod moral hazard that how many times we can do that. Uh, to cleanse the banks of the, out of their MPA process. So these structural elements are a matter of huge concern, but structural reforms take time. And uh, this firefighting is important to tackle immediately, but firefighting and uh, everything, it's focusing on the cyclical elements of the growth process, but growth is not just cyclical, it is cyclical plus structural. And synergy financing, of course, uh, I mentioned that uh, it is a very important uh, process but you know my director Pinaki Chakravarti he has spoken to the press trust of India why this is going to be uh, uh, you know uh, uh, problematic because he, his point was like twofold one is if R is greater than G then we have to eventually monetize the deficit that's a concern second is fiscal profligacy if the synergy financing and giving importance to you know we have done we have controlled the monetization of deficit in the early 90s or in the late 80s so once again if you open that path through the ad hoc treasury bills if we go ahead with that whether it opened the floodgate of fiscal profligacy that's another concern so we have to wait and see but as you rightly pointed out fiscal austerity is not the way 
you know we have to uh, his, the credit is not giving the complete story so sharon we have to think about the fiat money thanks a lot uh, professor tom and sharon for your brilliant questions and again the floor is open any more questions Lekha, I think there is a question in the chat box. So should I read it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, since there is a possible fear of uh, taper tantrum mm -hmm. in the near future, accompanied by heightening inflation on account of both opportunistic revenue extraction by the government in the form of tax, mm -hmm. as well as by means of possible supply disruptions on account of power outs and natural disasters, the central mm -hmm. bank would, would be forced to turn hawkish. Hmm. How is it going to satisfy both the same objective as uh, laid down in FIT as well as the responsibility to nourish the nascent recovery evolving over time? Hmm. Like an interest rate hike to prevent capital flow would hurt domestic capital formation, which has been a staggering issue for long. Yeah. But despite all the measures rolled out under ANB and many other schemes like corporate tax reduction, investor confidence still hmm. lies denied. So Correct. how the process of rejuvenation needs to be reshaped to satisfy the needs of the uh, economy as a whole. And it's by Aditya Krishnan. Uh, who? Aditya, Aditya Krishnan. Aditya Krishnan is a brilliant boy. <laughs> Good question. And, you know, that policy dilemma, you know, the way he articulated his concerns, that policy dilemma is there in his arguments and uh, how we can deal with the step deeper tantrum, tantrum then. Uh, you know, in the past, in 2013, if you look at the trend, we responded to it not through the interest rate defense. We responded to it through capital defense, you know, capital controls. And we also intervened in the foreign market, foreign exchange market, to control and uh, stabilize the rupee. But those capital controls and this intervening in the forex market, they turned out to be quite, uh, you know, partial. Uh, you know, these were not the long-term solutions. So I don't think that central bank will again go for a capital control or, you know, the kind of uh, stabilizing the rupee through massive or aggressive uh, foreign exchange market intervention. Then, you know, as you mentioned, interest rate defense is another methodology. But can we do that? You yourself identified uh, the constraints that if you go for that, our gross capital formation will suffer because we have to keep the interest rate steady or lower for the gross capital formation and also for the economic recovery. But then how you tackle this uh, capital flight? How can you gain the investors, foreign investors' confidence? Then, you know, all what is left is the policy strategy of working out with your macroeconomic fundamentals. And what are the macroeconomic fundamentals? Your current account uh, deficit, X minus M. And of course, you are financing the current account deficit through the capital flows. That's an, it's another story. The moment your capital becomes flighty, you are worried about your CAD. Uh, the, another crucial variable when you talk about macroeconomic fundamental is your fiscal deficit. But Aditya, can we do that? Can we reduce the fiscal deficit to GDP? That macroeconomic fundamentals have to be strong. It has to be back to 3% of GDP. Can we do that at this moment? Because that is also closely linked to the gross capital formation and your economic growth recovery. So right now, uh, the hawkish tendency, if we have to prevent that, uh, you know, interest rate from raising the another policy alternative is you always look, you know, you ask us to do the, fiscal deficit correction. So can I do that? This is a policy dilemma. Because the moment I control the fiscal deficit, we have seen the empirical evidence shows that the state governments, they have over-adjusted to the fiscal rules to keep the macroeconomic fundamentals strong at the cost of capital formation. Because if you have a strict 3% GDP fiscal deficit, uh, you know, then you over to it by not going for your capital spending and why the capital spending has dried up and if you look at the numbers gdp figures you know meticulously you can see that the gdp the growth happened not investment led it's a consumption led growth you know that's one thing the second is it's also profit led as you know dr tom mentioned you know 
when things are drying up, when the employment opportunities are getting limited, when your salaries are coming down, when there is an austerity, what is this uh, growth uh, recovery you are talking about in the, from the high frequency data? That growth recovery process may be profit led. So the financial exuberance is there. It's a profit led growth that is happening. Inequalities are widening. So these are real issues. And this is the policy dilemma. So if you ask me whether, as a, you know, if I am the central bank governor, if I go for in a hawkish rate of interest, uh, I think uh, I will not, Aditya, because growth recovery is very important. And uh, the capital flight issue that we need to tackle through different ways, but of course not through the interest rate defense. That's the only certainty I have right now. But what are the other macroeconomic channels in which we have to ensure investors' confidence, uh, you know, to avoid a capital flight, we need to work out, uh, you know. But even the high uh, fiscal deficit to GDP ratio, if, if, you, if you can substantiate, as I mentioned, that this high fiscal deficit to GDP happened because it is closely linked to the investment decisions, then I don't think that uh, this investor's confidence will suffer. So there are fragile economies like India, Brazil, Turkey. So we have to wait and see how we are going to respond. And in the Jackson Hole Economic Symposium, Jay Powell has given a lot of uh, right noises for, from the perspective of U.S. government that uh, they are going for this taper, this thing. But uh, you, you must have read the you know project syndicate that article by Stiglitz. Uh, you know Stiglitz caution that why Jay Powell should go. That's the title of that article. You take a look into that. So beggar thy neighbor hypothesis or beggar thy neighbor policies by the US Fed, that should not happen. So there is a pressure, a policy pressure uh, a, a, there, uh, you know, that's mounting. So I don't think that there will be a major taper, uh, a tapering process or that taper tantrum that's going to be real because there's a pressure that why he should go and why he should not announce beggar thy neighbor policies from US Fed. And uh, that's it. And um, yeah, over to you, Manju. I hope I have answered uh, Aditya Krishnan's question. And if he's around, he can talk to me if he has any supplementary questions. And all, I my all the best to Sharon and Aditya. Brand questions. Yeah. Lekha, I think yeah. uh, Sharon has raised one more question. And maybe sure. if you're tired, we'll stop with this question. And uh, the question is, ma'am, as you have mentioned, twin balance sheet crisis. Hmm. I would also like to know your take on whether giving operational independence to a committee or having a central bank autonomy is good for Indian economy in the long run. <laughs> <laughs> Sharon, I have to be very political right now. Because um, uh, you know, uh, my background is fiscal, right? And uh, I also enjoy monetary economics. But the moment you ask me about giving independence to RBI or giving independence to the monetary policy maker, my take is uh, a monetary policy, fiscal policy coordination is better. You can take a look into the works, uh, this uh, currency and finance, report on currency and finance. When Subir Gokhan was, uh, you know, deputy uh, governor of RBI uh, under his leadership, I think in, uh, I forgot the year. You can take a look into, because, you know, this RCF, it was discontinued for a long time. And then it reappeared this year to support, to substantiate uh, about this new monetary policy framework. You know, in March 2020, there was a pressure to go for a revision of the new monetary policy framework. And this RCF, after a long time, uh, in March 2020, there, 2021, there was an RCF. Uh, which was based on this NMF, a new monetary policy framework. Prior to that, you know, for many years, we didn't have RCF. Uh, so I think it's in 20, I forgot, I don't want to make a guess, but my point is the theme of that RCF was monetary policy, fiscal policy coordination. We forgot about this kind of, you know, uh, monetary literature or the macro economics literature. We are not talking about a monetary policy, fiscal policy coordination now. And the elements of this monetary policy and fiscal policy coordination, as I mentioned, you can see in the works of Sargent and Wallis, that is this unpleasant monetary arithmetic, which I mentioned. And now there is a recurrence of 
this policy coordination in the writings of Chicago School that reappeared in terms of fiscal policies of price determination. You can take a look into that literature. That's the Chicago School of Thought. And what is this fiscalist literature? Uh, you know, Mil Milton Friedman, uh, he mentioned, he wrote that inflation everywhere and always an, a, a monetary phenomenon. But no, inflation is not strictly a monetary phenomenon. So then comes the question, what is this fiscalist argument? Can inflation targeting, you know, pegging your policy rates based on inflationary expectations and output gap, that's the way we are doing the Steiler rule, right? And again, these two variables, inflationary expectations and your output gap are unobserved variables. But you, you found your own ways in to, to tackle it. Inflationary expectations, we have survey, inflationary expectations survey by RBI. An output gap, as I mentioned, using the filters, econometric methodology, they arrive at this output gap and going ahead with pegging the policy rate based on these two elements. We have a nominal anchor that is 4% inflation. We have a comfort zone plus or minus. And if the inflation goes beyond that comfort zone of 6%, then only the matter will be worse. And uh, in the RCF recently, they have argued that uh, we are well within this comfort zone. There is no need to revise this new monetary framework because prior to the new monetary policy framework, inflation was going above 11%, 12%. But after the new monetary policy framework, it was well within the 6%. We have sporadic or what G. G. Powell and you know, other central bank governors articulate is that I think it was there in the question asked to me prior also, like uh, it's based on the supply side supply chain disruptions, these inflationary pressures are transitory in nature. So that's the way they argue. But if you look at the fiscalist literature, it is also a kind of inflation targeting they talk about. You peg your interest rates based on inflationary expectations and output gap. And they do believe in this RNG process and this debt sustainability, everything is through having a Fiscal rule and a monetary policy rule, and a fiscal rule is a prerequisite for a monetary policy rule. So this is the way this argument, you know, uh, the, 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 the argument goes. So that's it. Uh, uh, so I don't think that uh, I will ever argue for a central bank independence in the context of an emerging country like India. Uh, but of course, this tug of war you always see between the not block and uh, uh, RBI. And if you, uh, you know, uh, look at it meticulously, everything boils down to the interest rate in which, you know, a not block always put pressure to RBI to keep the interest rates lower, you know, interest rates uh, a little lower. That That's the that's point. Um, you know, in that process, uh, I do believe that, um, you know, fiscal policy, monetary policy coordination is important. And you can take a look into the fiscal policy, monetary policy coordination linkages in the literature by Sargent and Ballas, that is unpleasant monetary arithmetic, and also in the fiscal theories of price determination, because price determination is not exactly monetary. There is a fiscal root. So fiscal theories of price determination, you can take a look. And also I have written about fiscal synergy. So how to arrive at your fiscal synergy, how to arrive at your uh, you know, fiscal uh, synergy laugh occur in which you can get a threshold uh, in which, uh, you know, this is the level of the synergy we can go. Uh, this is a level in which inflation peaks uh, and uh, you can give a policy suggestion based on your fiscal synergy laugh occur. And uh, thank you, Sharon, for that question. Sharon is a PG, Manju. She's a PG student. Oh, she is an MP student and uh, Aditya is just PG pass out. Okay. Okay. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I think his uh, master's project was also on in, uh, something related to this inflation modeling in India. Uh, Aditya's or Sharon's? Aditya, Aditya's. Uh, would love to see that getting published. You know, Aditya, yes. ask him to go ahead with publication, publishing yeah. his work. Yeah. Okay. okay. I think uh, we will wind up because it's six o'clock. So thank you so much, Lekha, for uh, what, uh, answering uh, all these questions. And uh, I take this opportunity to invite uh, Dr. S.R. Shija for proposing the vote of thanks.
respected Professor Anida, Professor Lekha Chakravarti, Professor Manjuesh Nair, other faculty members, family members, friends and students of Professor Ramachandran Nair, distinguished participants and my dear students. It's my privilege to propose vote of thanks on this occasion of the ninth annual lecture commemorating the late Professor K. Ramachandran Nair. As pointed out by the previous speakers, Professor Ramachandran Nair was a great teacher and an eminent researcher who inspired a large number of students. The average teacher explains complexity while the gifted teacher reveals simplicity. Professor Nair was a gifted teacher. He was a man of simplicity, both in life and teaching. Even after 25 years, I, remember, I clearly remember how brilliantly and beautifully he explained various topics in macroeconomics and Indian economy in our class at the department. Professor Lekha Chakravarti is one of the brightest students at the department under the headship of, headship of Professor Ramachandran Nair has produced. The greatest achievement of a teacher is the success of his students and uh, I'm sure that her enlightening and inspiring lecture on COVID-19 and macroeconomic policy response was one of the greatest tributes to the memory of Professor Ramachandran Nair. I'm sure that her interactions with the students will definitely motivate students to delve deeper into the subject. On behalf of the Department of Economics, Professor Ramachandran Nair Endowment Committee, I would like to express my sincere thanks to Professor Lekha Chakravarti. Thank you, Professor Lekha. I also take this opportunity to thank Professor Anida, our head of the department, for all support in organizing this lecture. We are greatly indebted to Professor Manjue Nair for her initiative in organizing this lecture. Even though she was having a lot of health issues after COVID infection, Professor Manju could successfully organize this lecture. Thank you, Professor Manju. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the family of Professor Ramachandran Nair for their support and encouragement and also for their presence. Many students and friends of Professor Ramachandran Nair are watching this program. Thank you all for the cooperation and support. Thanks to all faculty members in the department and faculty members from other colleges and students for your active participation and cooperation. Once again, thank you one and all. Thank you. No, I think Sindhu has raised a hand. Sindhu, so you yeah. want to speak? Manju. Yeah. Mm. Yes. How are you? Hi. Yeah, definitely. On, on, on behalf of all my family members, I express my thanks to the head and uh, all faculty members of the economics department for organizing this commemorative lecture. And a special thanks and gratitude to my dear Manju, who was a favorite student of Achen, and also to Lekha, who has agreed to deliver the lecture. And between NC had to leave uh, as he had to attend an APS uh, of his one of his uh, PhD students. So sorry, uh, Lekha and Manju, that he couldn't attend. Uh, only in, uh, in initial part only was able to attend. And uh, I'd like to uh, tell that Malu has also joined as Malika Narayan, so she is in Delhi. So she is also she has also joined uh, the meeting. Thank you, Manju, once again for organizing this, and also um, Dr. Anita. Thanks a lot, and also Shija and all others to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sindhu Cheji, and we are happy that uh, Malu has also joined. Okay, and uh, okay, thank you so much. I think I, am star I have started becoming emotional. So I think uh, yeah. we'll wind yeah, up I, now. I, 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 I can understand you. I can understand you well. Yeah. Thank you. So, thank you so much, Shichi and uh, Lekha also. Uh, Lekha, we invite you to the department uh, for interacting with our students. Next time when you come over to Trivandrum, please give me a call and uh, definitely you will come to the department and let us uh, cherish the memories of uh, our uh, dear and great uh, professor. And uh, maybe let us, uh, I don't know what to say. Sure. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. you so much, Manju. Thank you, Sindhu Chichi. Thank you so much.